While a relatively morbid and unsettling statement, it is nonetheless true. As Dr. King states in his article written in the New England Journal of Medicine, the crisis of injury created by war has often led to innovation in trauma care and surgical creativity, and many of our best practices were forced by war into widespread adoption. Over the centuries, improved and more efficient methods of killing also bring about improved practices in saving lives. While many advances in caregiving have been discovered on the battlefield, the one intervention in trauma care that has always proven to be most effective is reducing time to get to a surgeon. Dr. King's article provides a concise yet comprehensive review of the advances in trauma care over the past 20 years. He provides information on the latest approaches in field care as well as goals to definitive management in the operating room. In care of the critically ill trauma patient, we utilize an evidence-based approach to the extent that we are able while extrapolating best practices along the way, oftentimes allowing the evidence to catch up to our practice. From a pre-hospital perspective, it's mainly damage control where we stop the bleeding we can find, attempt to control the bleeding that we may or may not be able to see, while rapidly and simultaneously moving the patient closer to surgical intervention. Hospital care continues what was done in the field. While some of the advanced technology in a modern trauma center has made its way into the pre-hospital environment, true resuscitation and injury mitigation occurs once the patient hits the doors of the trauma bay. With the fundamental principles of therapy revolving around stopping the bleed and preventing the lethal triad of trauma, hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. While most of these familiar approaches are now common practice, modern innovation continues to take hold based upon need. Once a mainstay of trauma care that had gone out of favor but is now seeing a resurgence over the last 10 years is the use of tourniquets. While the makeshift tourniquets that we learned to create out of necessity were largely ineffective and limb loss due to their use was relatively high, commercial devices, standardized training, and improved evacuation times have actually saved limbs and have prevented fatal exsanguination. While the use of tourniquets to control limb exsanguination is fairly straightforward, there are those areas of the body, such as the groin and the axilla, that are a little more difficult to control in the event of massive hemorrhage. This is where the use of junctional tourniquets come into play. The resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta device, or REBOA, is a rapidly emerging technique to control non-compressible cavity hemorrhage. It is less invasive than aortic cross clamping for a patient who is already hemodynamically compromised due to massive hemorrhage. It can be positioned based on hemorrhage location. Superior for an actual or suspected infradiaphragmatic hemorrhage or more inferior for a pelvic hemorrhage. While many of these approaches and interventions have been adopted into survival flights trauma protocols, there are still several that we are either looking to implement or improve upon within our own scope of practice. One is our ability to bring massive transfusion to the patient more quickly. While blood products are available in most critical access hospitals, many have yet to adopt the evidence-based massive transfusion protocols for the simple fact that they lack the blood bank resources of larger trauma centers. The ability to initiate massive transfusion to the hemodynamically unstable trauma patient and provide this resource to small hospitals and accident scenes is one potential game changer in the management prior to the patient getting to the trauma center as we will now have the ability to replace circulating blood volume as well as much needed clotting factors. While whole blood provides all needed components to critically injured trauma patients, it is not practical for use in most civilian trauma scenarios. Component therapy with packed red cells and plasma is integral to many helicopter EMS trauma management protocols. However, this can become a logistical challenge, especially at remote sites where blood bank support is not available. One novel idea that is not new by any stretch of the imagination is freeze-dried plasma. Unlike current plasma supplies that have to be slowly thawed from frozen storage, the dehydrated and powdered freeze-dried version needs no refrigeration and can be used within minutes after reconstituting it in sterile water. Believe it or not, this concept is not new. It was developed for battlefield use in World War II. However, it was abandoned over the years due to high infection rates. With new and improved methods of separation and processing, the concern of infection has been drastically reduced. 
In fact, freeze-dried plasma has been safely used by the Israeli Defense Force as well as helicopter EMS programs in the United Kingdom for several years. The IDF's algorithm for the management of hemodynamically unstable trauma patients shows how it is incorporated within the context of what we would consider mainstay hemorrhage control. The IDF has been using freeze-dried plasma as its primary volume expander and to replenish lost coagulation factors in trauma patients since 2011. Data from a retrospective matched cohort study was collected from the IDF Trauma Registry and the National Israeli Trauma Registry, and results show that the use of freeze-dried plasma in the pre-hospital setting has logistical benefits and a positive effect on coagulation profile. Based on this study and practice, an air ambulance trust in southeast England conducted a similar study with a much larger data pool and found similar results. As you can see, while the look of their management algorithm is a bit different, practices and components are nearly identical. So if reconstituted freeze-dried plasma has been proven to be safe and effective in the management of critically injured, hemodynamically unstable trauma patients, why are we not utilizing it here? Well, in July of last year, through an emergency use authorization, the FDA has granted the military approval for its use on the battlefield. So like any other innovative strategy in trauma management over the last hundred years, we will wait for reports on the military's findings. With that said, the FDA is in the process of developing guidelines for how plasma can be freeze-dried and processed for safe transfusion purposes. Hopefully this means that we will have access to it and be able to conduct full-scale studies on its use in the not-too-distant future. Thank you.